More twists in the Murdoch family murder mystery. Alex Murdoch's lawyer dropping some bombshells tonight about that shooting last weekend. He says his client was far more injured than everyone thinks and says Alex Murdoch has a description of both the shooter and the vehicle. Plus, there may just be witnesses. So why are the police saying otherwise? And then, it can't all be serious. Name the comedian whose albums have outsold Chris Rock's, Adam Sandler's, and Jerry Seinfeld's, with every single one of them hitting number one on the Billboard comedy charts. Bill Engvall is one quarter of the legendary Blue Collar Comedy Tour, and he joins us tonight on Banfield. Welcome to Banfield. Every time we think there can't possibly be another twist in the Murdoch family murder mystery, there is. And hold on to your hats. The twists we have to report tonight are huge. Alex Murdoch's to set the record straight in this very complicated story. And there are major contradictions between what he is saying to various media outlets and to what law enforcement have said after Alex Murdoch was airlifted to a hospital with a gunshot wound to the head last weekend. Let's run down the list of what Murdoch's lawyer is saying. The extent of Murdoch's injuries. Well, at the time, law enforcement called them superficial, even non-existent. But now Murdoch's lawyer says, not so. He says there was an entry and exit wound, a skull fracture and brain bleeding. Also, the details of the shooting itself. Murdoch's lawyer had this to say about the shooter. The driver of this truck rolled his window down, came to a stop and asked if Murdoch had car trouble. Murdoch said he didn't know if he could change the tire nor whether he had the equipment to do so. And then the lawyer says Murdoch was shot. He says the driver was male and driving a blue pickup truck. So why does the incident report that we just received from the sheriff have none of those details? Nothing like that. The suspect section is almost blank. No mention of a blue pickup truck. And under suspect's gender, it says unknown. And Murdoch's lawyer says his client gave a description of the suspect to a South Carolina law enforcement uh, division sketch artist. That sketch, though, has not been released. The reason? Jim Griffin, Murdoch's lawyer, says because SLED says it wasn't satisfied and that they need additional details from Murdoch, but that Murdoch plans to meet with them after he has finished detoxing in rehab. None of those details has been released by SLED. Why? Well, holy heck, according to Murdoch's lawyer, there is one and potentially two witnesses that may be out there. Just let that sink in for a moment. Murdoch's lawyer says a good Samaritan actually picked up the bleeding Alex Murdoch off the highway after discovering him shot in the head and then drove him towards the hospital only to meet up with an oncoming ambulance and transfer the patient. He says Murdoch actually called 911 from that Good Samaritan's car. The sheriff's report mentions that one of the officers spoke to Murdoch on the highway before he was airlifted, but the report has zero mention of a Good Samaritan on the scene or any witnesses. To help find some clarity, if we can, in all of this, I'm joined by Andrew Davis, an investigative reporter for WSAV-TV. He has covered this story extensively. Susan E. Williams is a criminal defense attorney and a former prosecutor who lives in the county where Alex Murdoch's wife and son were brutally gunned down back in June. And Alfred Titus is a former NYPD homicide detective who is a professor in the criminal justice department of John Jay University. Thanks to all three of you. So, Andrew, let me begin with you as a reporter who has been covering this story to all of a sudden have to juggle the avalanche of all of these details that came from Alex Murdoch's attorney himself. What do you make of this? I've never seen anything where you get multiple statements in one day based by an hour here, an hour here, and an hour here. And then you add in the sheriff's statement, by the way, Sheriff T.C. Smalls out of Hampton County came right out almost immediately after the story came and said, well, wait a second, that, that report's not correct. So you begin to wonder what exactly is happening. 
Add to that, Ashley, the apparent belief that there could be video from the nearby church that was also with a camera pointed in that direction. Don't know what it's got, but SLED does have that in their hands. SLED still hasn't answered a lot of these questions. Now you're adding on this Good Samaritan situation and also a very detailed description of a suspect which never came up in any of the previous interviews or issues that they were talking about as a lawyer. I'm very confused about why now this is coming out and suddenly how we have some detail about blue truck, about a suspect and this Good Samaritan which came out of absolutely nowhere. So I'm glad you mentioned the church. Um, I do want to just mention that the detail that Jim Griffin, Alex Murdoch's lawyer, has given is pretty significant. Um, he says that the driver, well, first he says Alex pulled over, got out of his car after he noticed an indicator light that he had a low tire on his late wife's Mercedes Benz. So he pulled over, got out of his car. When a truck passed, the pickup truck turned around at the same john's baptist church and drove back to murdoch so hopefully there could be some surveillance video from that saint john's baptist church because that's a very specific detail susan e williams as a criminal defense attorney as a former prosecutor i know details matter and all of these things matter and they can be checked they can be verified they can be proven or disproven but i'm concerned about the incident report being almost empty and then changing I can assume that that is disquieting for you as well. Well, actually, I think that the Hampton police made this report and then SLED took over. And so I don't really see it as that big of a problem. SLED, it, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division has more resources, more manpower, and they immediately took over this investigation, Hampton County or the Hampton police simply responded. They probably did a very brief synopsis of what was happening and South Carolina law enforcement division has already made a public statement that they will not hurry along this investigation or any other investigation until they have everything ready, the investigation complete and then mm. we'll know exactly what's what happened. So Alfred Titus, jump in with me here because I, I agree with what Susan says, but at the same time, when I look at the report and I had to print it out for myself because it's just a one pager, you can see a lot of it's sort of empty in the middle here. I just felt very uncomfortable about this one little nugget, visible injuries, no. And then that's been changed. And the reason was it was a computer glitch but one of the responding officers did see Alex Murdoch before he was loaded into the ambulance and, uh, and taken off by air flight. Another one was on the scene of where the shooting happened. And yeah, Alex wasn't there, but don't they get together and pool their information before they just say person unknown, untracked, suspect not there, visible injury, no. And to that suspect, my goodness, like, there's nothing. There's race unknown, sex unknown, age zero zero, ethnicity unknown, uh, person unknown, untracked. But Jim Griffin, Dr. Titus, knows all of this stuff. Just as a pub, as a member of the public, let alone a journalist, I'm, I'm annoyed by this. If this is a, by the way, can I just mention at the top? I've got it highlighted. This is an attempted murder. It's not just you know shoplifting or a bike stolen, and it's an attempted murder. And so we, the public, don't we deserve to know more if there's some crazed gunman killer out there? Yes, yes, um, I agree uh, 100. percent There, there appears to be. Uh, continuous conflicting stories. And although that is not unusual to come from a victim, um, when law enforcement decides not to release information to the public, it's usually because they have an ongoing investigation. Um, it would behoove the victim and his attorney to also follow suit and not give information that, that could seem conflicting and that could, that could actually uh, hinder the investigation. So there are a lot of issues here. The fact that the police report, uh, the initial report is not completely filled out or there seems to be areas missing or, or, or incorrect such, um, information, that could possibly occur as a result of the confusion going on at the situation, as well as the second law enforcement agency now stepping in to take over the 
the case. However, it does raise questions. Boy, does it. Um, okay, so Andrew Davis, the, the, the lack of, well, it feels like lack of urgency, right? They have a sketch. <laughs> there were witnesses. There, there were good Samaritans, apparently, according to Jim Griffin, the, the lawyer for Alex Murdoch. They're testing blood inside that Mercedes GLS, the, the, the late wife's vehicle, to, to corroborate that this was Alex Murdoch's blood as he was reaching into his vehicle to get his phone to call 911, presumably bleeding from the head. There's a lot of detail that... that that Jim Griffin is telling the public that the that the uh, police certainly aren't. But this sketch not being released, isn't that unfair? If there's an attempted murderer out there, somebody who may also be involved in the shooting of a wife and child out there, we've got nothing on any of these killings, shootings. We, we've just got nothing, and it just doesn't feel normal. This is a question I've asked Sled multiple times now on multiple occasions starting this weekend about shouldn't the public have some knowledge? Shouldn't the public know something about what's going on? Initially, they said in the first shootings during the murders that there was no danger to the public. And they said, well, that's because we didn't believe the shooter was in that specific area. Now we have another shooter. Jim Griffin also talked to me the day of and that shooting and was very adamant when we talked specifically from other sources that I got it, that there was a truck. There was a man inside that truck but he wasn't going to give that out. Now, suddenly, he's more than willing to give out interesting details about the truck out there, about exactly what happened, where previously he was very tight-lipped on it. And that's where the, the sled issue is getting me right now, is they're saying nothing about this. There are public in Hampton County who are screaming for some sort of help because they are worried about this. If you thought they were worried about what the Murdoch family could do to them in the past, they have someone out here with a gun, at least one shooting, possibly two murders to go with it. And they have heard absolutely nothing from law enforcement about what they should be afraid of or who they should be looking for. And it's really frightening a lot of people. And it's making a lot of people question why SLED is being exactly as tight-lipped as they are. I mean, Susan Williams, this is, you know, your you know backyard. You, you live in the county where his wife and son were brutally killed. And when I say brutally... A shotgun to um, young Paul Murdoch's head and torso, um, a, a rifle to, to his mother near the dog kennels, just left, you know, on the ground. And, and this is not, um, like I said, it's not a stolen bike. It's not the kind of thing that doesn't matter. It matters. And now an attempted murder on Alex Murdoch. Surely that, you know, your neighbors in the community have got to be saying, what on earth is going on? Well, there are people that have heard that would like to have some more information, but the, the local newspaper in Charleston, South Carolina, is the Post and Courier, and they filed a lawsuit against law enforcement to release and divulge information. And Judge Bentley Price ruled that SLED was ripe the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division had not violated the Freedom of Information Act. So it doesn't really come as any surprise that's, that the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division is being tight-lipped about this. It's been uh, since June that the double murders occurred, and it's only been a few days since uh, the this, this shooting occurred. And so uh, my belief is, is that SLED, it may all be possibly connected, it may not be connected, but whatever it is, SLED's keeping it close to the vest for, and for yeah. good reason, I understand. Yeah, you know, I do respect that we just don't always have the right to know everything, that police have to work in their mysterious ways some way, sometime in order to, to actually solve crimes and protect, you know, litigation and evidence. I get that. But when there's a killer out there, I expect to see a dang sketch if there is one. And I don't need to wait till Alex Murdoch gets out of rehab to get more details. An early sketch will do just fine. Thank you. And I would just assume for the good people of the low country, they'd feel the same way. Okay, all three of you stand by for a minute. When we come back after the break, there's a whole other twist. And it's a big money twist in the millions. Six million, maybe. Tens of millions, 
Maybe. But that man on your screen who's already lost that wife and one son and nearly lost his own life is about to lose his shirt because his insurance company says it is not paying out on the civil lawsuit against him and one of his sons and others for that deadly boat crash from a couple years ago. We'll explain in a moment. Welcome back to our special coverage of the shocking new twists in the Murdoch family murder mystery. Today, the lawyer for South Carolina lawyer Alex Murdoch contradicted almost everything that we've heard from law enforcement about the alleged attempt on Alex Murdoch's life on Saturday. You probably heard that he was shot in the head. Well, Alex Murdoch's lawyer, Jim Griffin, says that that gunshot wound, um, which he survived, was a heck of a lot more serious than the authorities said. He said it included an entry and an exit wound, a skull fracture, and significant brain bleeding. Griffin also says that Murdoch saw the suspect's face and vehicle and gave the details for a sketch to the investigator, something that the police never reported. And to top it all off, there is supposedly a good Samaritan witness, maybe two out there who can at least partially corroborate Murdoch's story. Our excellent legal panel is still with me. So, Alfred Titus, I want you to comment on one aspect before I get to the money, and that is the money that he may not get from his insurance company to cover these wrongful death lawsuit issues he's dealing with. There's one more detail that Alex Murdoch's lawyer has given us, and it is a doozy, I think, and I want to get your feeling on it, Dr. Titus. Jim Griffin said that he was in conversation with SLED law, uh, law enforcement officers and that they said there was no gun found on the side of the road where this shooting happened, alleged shooting happened, in Murdoch's car, nor in the area. So if this was, as some people had speculated, Alex Murdoch trying to commit suicide on the side of the road, uh, well, you'd have to have gotten rid of that gun somewhere. So that's got to be significant, isn't it? Yes, it definitely is. If if there is a belief that the individual uh, injured himself, then the weapon would have to be on the scene. However, there are many different ways that that weapon could have disappeared. Um, another car could have taken it away. Um, there are multiple uh, possibilities with that as well. Oh, now you're talking conspiracy, <laughs> and you know that's the C word around these parts, oh, Dr. Yeah, Titus. That's okay. Big. That's, big. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's big. That's the, that's the B word, big. Um, there's one other detail. He said that, that, that Sled told uh, him that, well, Sled told, um, you know, family members at least that Jim Griffin is releasing that there was a puncture, a, sl a slice wound in the uh, white sidewall of the Mercedes tire. So that was interesting as well, uh, because we had heard that the tire, you know, was likely slashed and that there was a knife that was recovered. That was a, a report that came out. So, Susan, the money. I always say in these stories, follow the money. And I know as a prosecutor, uh, this will be interesting to you. Um, it's a federal case. As I understand it, you've been looking up cases and there's lots to report on. I think upwards of five different cases involving the Murdochs. Did you find five different cases? At some point in time, there were five. I think we're down to four now. Uh, would you want me to go through what those cases are? Well, we'd probably need a whole hour, um, given the saga that we're in. The one I'm so interested in, though, is the federal case where the, the insurance company, um, Philadelphia Indemnity, has basically thumbed their nose at Alex Murdoch and said, we are not paying out uh, on that boat accident that killed Mallory Beach. We are not going to cover you in a wrongful death case that was filed by her mom. The, the policy was, I think, $6 million. There's no price on the wrongful death, but you and I both know those things go uh, well into the, you know, double-digit millions. What do you think that's all about? Do you think it'll stand? Well, what I know is there are two commercial insurance policies, and they're commercial. And so, they are intended to cover a business. And in this case, there was no, uh, neither of the policies named a specific business. The, the policies cover injuries for private 
hunting operations. Um, so as it doesn't really seem to me, it may seem to, to some, but it, it doesn't seem to me that this boating accident has anything to do with a hunting operation or business. And that's what the insurance company's defenses are. That and that the uh, Alec Murdoch and his son, actually Buster, who's named in this, are not the named insureds as individuals. Mm. So a well, lot there's of also reasons. this little... Um... Yeah, that's I, that stood out to me that this was no business trip that young Paul and his teenage friends were on when they were loaded and driving at night from a bar. That's not a business trip. Um, but there's also this this mention. Um, it says that Murdoch had no had knowledge or should have had knowledge that his minor son illegally purchased and consumed alcohol on a regular basis by using or displaying the driver's license of his adult son Murdoch Jr., which is. Buster, Buster. Um, who's named in this suit as well. So there's these two areas that they're fighting. So that'll be interesting to watch also. So Andrew Davis, I don't know if you've heard any of this, um, and I don't know whether it's going to go anywhere or not. But one of the issues in the reporting we're seeing on the finance problems is that, and I can't even believe we're going there, we're going to bring COVID into this, um, was that Alex Murdoch's firm, where he's now out, uh, they they actually had been given a, a million dollar loan by the Paycheck Protection Program. And we all know that's the government money that was given to companies to pay your employees so that they wouldn't, you know, go, go moneyless during the, the, you know, these furloughs. Um, and, the, and this company was forgiven, forgiven the million dollars. Um, you know, that's based on if you've paid your employees. It's a million dollars and all the reporting is that the million dollars is an embezzlement figure as well. Is anyone connecting Alex Murdoch to the million dollar paycheck protection program money that was forgiven and that a million dollar embezzlement investigation that's going on right now, which is the reason that he, you know, that's a lot to process. I'm sorry, a lot of detail, but you know where I'm going, right? God, tell me it's not government money that we might be talking about. Well, we don't know at this point. Remember that he is a lead partner in this law firm. The other thing that came out, which was interesting in that statement, is Alec Murdoch's, Jim Griffin came out, his lawyer came out and said specifically that Alec wants to pay the firm back. He didn't talk about any lawsuits. He didn't talk about anything else. But he plans to go ahead and pay the firm back. And you have to go, you're not a lawyer. You don't have the ability to practice anymore. It's been taken away from the South Carolina Supreme Court. You don't have that ability, and now you're saying you're going to plan to pay the firm back somewhere. Doing what exactly, unless you're going to start selling property? They've already circled the wagons and started to protect the properties from the civil cases, putting some in Maggie's name already before she was killed to try to separate that out so it would not be played out. One of the lawsuits came out specifically and said, we are now attaching this lawsuit to two of the properties, including the one that Maggie and Paul were killed on, along with another spot in Edisto where Maggie apparently may have been living or called her residence. So there's a lot of money moving around to try to protect against the civil lawsuit. You have the insurance factor of the fact that these kids supposedly went to a family friend's party and drank there and may very well have been known to go to their grandfather's house, Paul's grandfather's house, Randolph, and drink there. So there are a lot of questions about who knew exactly how much they were drinking, when they were drinking, and if they were taking the boats out. There's a lot of money moving around to see what's protected from civil lawsuits. And now that he says he's going to give it back to the law firm, who is a multi-million dollar law firm, is very interesting. Well, I'm always interested in uh, life insurance policies as well, especially when a wife dies. But I'm not as interested when a son dies right beside her. Um, that's for sure. It doesn't make my spidey senses tingle as much. However, this story has so many as it says on the bottom of the screen, bizarre twist. Andrew Davis, Susan E. Williams, and Dr. Alfred Titus, thank you, all three of you, for your uh, expert wisdom tonight. I appreciate it. I'm going to switch gears now. Um, you know, you really can't get much further south than Galveston, Texas, right? I love that place. But that's where Bill Engvall started. His star, however, was going to rise all the way to Hollywood with one of the most successful comedy tours ever. Now Bill's got a big announcement, and he's going to share it with us next. Since I know that my next guest is a huge Dallas Cowboys fan, 
and who isn't. Um, and they open their season tonight. I'm going to read you his statistics as if he were a pro athlete instead of just a legendary comedian. Six straight seasons with the Blue Collar Comedy Tour, whose movies sold over nine million copies. His album, Here's Your Sign, held first place on the Billboard comedy charts for 15 straight weeks and went certified platinum. And believe it or not, the man has a Grammy nomination for the soundtrack to the Blue Collar Comedy Tour as well. And Here's Your Sign of a Great Comedian, welcome Bill Engvall. It's nice to see you, Bill. How you doing? Well, I'm doing great. Uh, as I'm glad to hear you're a Cowboy fan. I'm really proud they're hanging in there tonight against the uh, <laughs> the, the greatest player of all time, pretty. But but uh, yeah. The, hey, listen. I got to tell you something. I've got to do a lot of things in my career. Uh, this might be the capper. Getting interviewed by Ashley Banfield, who I have to admit, uh, I have a, a bit of a crush on. Oh come on now! You're you're drinking again. What's that about? Are no, you kidding me? For, oh, are you kidding? <laughs> I go back to the glasses days. <laughs> oh, pre-surgery. <laughs> As I get older, I lose glasses, and everybody else on TV, all the ladies, they all get older and wear glasses. They got it backwards. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, uh, the, the, thank you for the Grammy nomination announcement. But uh, having a Grammy nomination is just a polite way of saying he didn't win. So. <laughs> Oh, come on now. Hey, you, uh, mister, uh, you have a big announcement to make. What is it? Uh, yeah, it's the uh, I am retiring from the road. Uh, I've been doing it now for 42 years, and uh, I'm a new grandfather, and uh, it's time for me to start spending some time with my family. Uh, I've enjoyed every minute of the road. Uh, it's, it's, I would be lying to say I'm sure there'll be moments that I'll miss it. But uh, I always said, Ashley, you know, when it's when the traveling starts taking over the fun of being on stage, it, it's time to, to hang it up because I don't ever want to cheat my fans. You know, we've all been to a concert where the artist just kind of walked through it. And I, I just never wanted to be that guy. And so but it, I'll tell you what was funny was we started this tour. Now, the here's your sign is finally time. And the first show I, I did uh, the end of the show, the people jumped to their feet and were clapping and cheering. And I thought in my head, oh, are you doing the right thing? And I went, yes, 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 you are. You're doing the right thing. <laughs> okay, Bill, I already sense this could be a Rolling Stones moment. Like, you'll do this tour, no. and then you're just going to you're just gonna come back because the, the flood of tears out here in your fan land, it's going to force you back onto the stage. Uh, listen, I never say never, but, yeah, I don't want to be that. You know, I think well, the Eagles are on their ninth retirement tour, and uh, so <laughs> – it's, uh, you know, I'll tell you what's interesting is that, that COVID, uh, the whole, when the, because it was over a year before we couldn't perform, which was sad because uh, at a time when America needed laughter, we couldn't give it to them. But I, I realized that when I, when the shows finally started coming back online, that I, I wasn't missing the traveling. Uh, when I first started this thing, I'd be packed two or three days before I left for a trip. Now it's gotten where like an hour before I got to leave for an airport, I'm throwing stuff into a bag. So but uh, it's been it's been such a wonderful run on the road. Uh, I got to be honest with you, Ashley. If you had told me this 41 years ago that I'd still be doing this, I'd, I'd have said you were smoking something. <laughs> well, you know what? I have to say, when you're in the business of, you know, either talking to people or entertaining people, every single day should be a blessing, and no one should ever complain because you're only as good as your last, you know, appearance. So, but you're you're not going away. I mean, you're still going to no, do no, no, a lot no. of projects. Good God, where did y'all get that clip of that foot? I don't even know who that guy is. <laughs> 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 he looks like a 12 year old it's boy. It's the hero tour. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, no, actually, actually, I'm going to really concentrate now on film and TV. Uh, I've got a new show coming out called Blue Collar Auction, which is kind of a uh, American Pickers meets uh, Barrett Jackson. Uh, and it's it's an it's an auction uh, for for the everyday guy and girl. Uh, you don't have to be a millionaire to, to bid on these things. Uh, and and that is really fun for me to get a, to interact with the sellers because, I, you know, I don't have to go on stage and go, hey, we got five, give me 10, we got I just talked to the the seller, and while we're talking, the bidders on the video board uh, will will get a chance to bid. And then there's gonna if it's not already up, there's gonna be a blue collar auction website where people can actually go on and bid on items there. So it's it really is one man's trash is another man's treasure.
Except that I got a look at some of the the stuff and it is not even close to being trash. I mean, for heaven's sake, let me take a look here. There's um, a mandolin that was owned by Bill Wyman of, of the Stones. Yeah. There's a Pontiac GTO driven by Lady Gaga. I would bid on that. What else do you have? What other really good sweet little uh, items are going to be on the show? Well, you're right. It, it, it's not tra trash. is probably a bad word because there's some really cool stuff. Uh, we had uh, 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 Lorenzo Lamas uh, auctioned off his Harley from Renegade, uh, which was kind of, it was kind of cool to share the stage with with the Renegade. Uh, we had uh, uh, Kyle Petty, who we he donated some stuff for his charity that we auctioned off. One of the but the thing that's interesting to me is you know we have cars and trucks and antiques. We had a dress that Mae West wore in one of her movies. Uh, but the one of the coolest things, and, and you get these weird kind of things is. This couple came on uh, a show and they were all dressed in goth and they had this metal box with glass windows in it and hanging inside of it were the skeletons of two bats. And you know, I was like, I was like, well, all right. And I said, well, how much do you think you want to get for this? And they said, we'd like to get $500. And I remember thinking, yeah, there's a lot of things I'd like too, but that ain't going to happen. The dang thing sold well, wait. for 700 No, Bill, uh, if, if those bats had anything to do with Ozzy Osbourne or Alice Cooper, you're lowballing at 500 Well, unfortunately, they did. They were just bats. And were the just... thing sold for 750 bucks. <laughs> Who knew there was that many bat enthusiasts out there? Oh my, you're j holy cow. And, and by the way, <laughs> anybody, like I could sit in my jammy pants and do this, right? Like it's virtual. I can, I can bid on these items from the comfort of my home, right? Oh, absolutely. In fact, it'd be great to have some Ashley Banfield glasses uh, auctioned off. I bet those would go for a high dollar. <laughs> I don't know. They kind of look like Fred Flintstone clothing. I listen. When I'm at home, hey, you were a I, groundbreaker. Come on, lady. You were you were you were leading the edge. Oh well, you know. And then you know, just 20 years passed, and now I'm just boring <laughs> with straight hey, hair and you know, to, welcome, like, welcome hippie to the club. <laughs> I, I, I just looked at a thing today that I, I I'm I'm going to be available for, uh, for Medicare. That that is that's an eye opener. The <laughs> so. jeepers and and I'll bet that that envelope that you get you know welcome to the AARP that you know you don't even care about that anymore right? Oh, I'm full on member there. It's uh you know hey. but this is it. Go, no, ahead. go ahead. Oh, I just I was gonna say this is you know this is what I love about this business. I've got to do and be a part of some of the coolest things. You know, when I had my own sitcom, we gave Jennifer Lawrence her first job. Uh, and she went on to do all right. And uh, it's uh, just the, the the events and the the, the people you meet, uh, whether they're celebrities or fans or whatever. It's just it's been an amazing, amazing journey. And uh, you know, to get a act with Tim Allen and uh, you know Billy Ray Cyrus, and, you know, and, and some of these people. It's I just it, it, it's a dream that I ne I mean, I guess I thought I might have dreamt it, but the thought of the reality of it just was never going to happen. And yeah, Look there's how Jenny. Cute and me. She uh, oh man. Yeah, she's. Uh, I hear she's. Uh, she's gonna have a baby, I guess, pretty soon. So, uh, it's. Uh, uh -huh. I've just been so honored to be a part of this and be a part of the blue collar guys. And uh, uh, you know, uh, if, if I had my dream, actually, I think my dream for this auction show would be to take it live. You know, maybe come to like Chicago and do. Uh, is, is it still called the Rose Theater? uh there's uh you know and i don't do know but i will be your agent it's the i think the rosemont theater i'm being told but rosemont, if that's, that's what it, you want to do i i'll only go six percent i'm not going to be that greedy 10 percent agent or 20 percent. hey listen i gotta fit in a break really quickly but um bill when we come back i want to talk to you but i love doing this too i love interviewing funny people because i just you guys are just awesome and i interviewed jay leno and hank azaria and a whole bunch of other comedians and we we talked a lot about this new treading on eggshells about the kinds of jokes that you can and can't tell and you know how hard it is to ply your trade. When we come back, that's what I'm gonna ask Bill about. That the whole new idea that cancel culture can be really, really scary, especially when you're in the business of performing live. It's coming next. My grandmother could be walking through the house talking and I'd egg it on. I said, well, how are you doing today, Grandma? She goes, well, Billy, I'm doing all right, I guess. They're not shoveling dirt on top of me. <laughs> I guess that's a good day. <laughs>
It'd be my granddad sitting in his favorite chair with the newspaper up. My grandmother would just be walking through the house talking, and I'd egg it on. <laughs> Me and my granddad. Well, Bill Angvall is a grandfather himself now, and maybe he's going to pass on some of that pretty funny DNA to his little peanut, or maybe the peanut will be on stage making fun of Grandpa in a couple of years. But how cute is that? Boy, that'd be a great thing. If I were walking down the sidewalk and I just happened to pass you with that carriage, man, I don't know whether I just want to fawn all over the baby or ask for your autograph, Bill, but do you get stopped a lot when you're on the street, especially when you're out, you know, uh, walking the baby? You know, it's actually, uh, actually, it's, it's, I have somehow been able to be lucky enough to fall into that great little area that people recognize you and they'll come up to you, but I, I don't have to, you know, it, it's never been, uh, I bet I can count on one hand the, the times it's been uncomfortable. Uh, my fans are great. They, you know, they just, and I think a lot of it comes from the fact that I don't consider myself a celebrity. Uh, and so, you know, like when I, that would be me walking down the street with a stroller with my granddaughter or in the Walmart or in the Sam's club or Costco or whatever. And uh, I think that, that, that came, I learned a lot of that from being with the blue collar guys that, you know, we're just, we're just all humans when we, when you boil it all away. You know, I think you have to worry about it when people stop uh, asking you for your autograph. You know, when you're in the business of being public, you, that's when you got to get nervous. I see a picture of Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy, and I'm sure most of your fans already know, but you guys are pretty tight, aren't you? Yeah, Jeff's a great guy. I've learned uh, Jeff is, uh, was very instrumental early on in my career uh, once I uh, got out. In fact, he, uh, he took me out on the road with him, and I opened for him for about a year or two, and uh, Learned a lot. He's just a great guy, great family man, a uh, man of faith, and uh, just uh, a good guy to know. And, and as were all of them, uh, you know, even for all four different personalities, we uh, we just gelled. And and I think we were all just uh, amazed that here was three, uh, four friends being on the road, and they're throwing stupid money at you, and you're selling out arenas. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't. And there's Larry the Cable Guy, too. I was just showing that picture of him. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the big question that's just burning for so many people right now, and that is cancel culture and how hard it is for comedians, especially when you're live and there's no second take and there's no edits, um, to, to sort of navigate the landscape and, you know, worry about being Kathy Griffin, like, boom, like that. W what are your thoughts on that, Bill? Well, I, I do think that uh, we've, we've entered into a, an era where People are uber sensitive about everything. Uh, I personally don't have to worry about it too because my stuff's so middle of the road, family. And but you know, even I get you know people that'll come up and say, you know, I really don't think you ought to be talking about you know. And you know, I try to remind them in a nice way. These are just jokes. These aren't. I'm not making policy here. I'm not trying to tell you what you need to think. Uh, but I think most comedians are starting to realize that it really is getting harder and harder because. And I, I wish I knew the answer. Actually. I wish I knew what, why people became that way because it's comedy is just something so wonderful. Uh, you know, and you, I can go down the list of guys that, uh, you know, you, you think would never have to worry about saying a thing. And, and all of a sudden now they're in hot water over something they said or so it is, it, it's hard. I, you know, that's why in my shows, I, I don't do any political stuff, uh, mainly because I'm not smart enough to to keep up with it that as much as it goes. And, and nor do I do religious stuff, you know, any, but because like I could write the greatest political joke ever, but already I've alienated 50% of the audience. And why do I want to do that? You know, it's so I, uh, I, I, I get, I get it where a lot of guys, you know, uh, Bill Maher, Bill Burr, Kathy Griffith, you go down the list, you know, what they do is, is an art and, Yet it somehow has become this offensive thing, and I and I don't get it. Uh, it's uh, you know, people are, are are really quick to want to bail on you, and that's why I just feel blessed that I've been able to do this for as long as I have, and uh, and 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 pretty much uh, kept my nose to the grindstone. You know, Bill, um, I interviewed Jay Leno, and he said, uh, and he's even said it more recently than our interview, um, you got to change your jokes. You got to change with the times or you're going to die, and that's just the way it is. And then other people say, hold your horses there. Like Adam Carolla says, no, stop apologizing and, and, and back your guy. Like if you're ABC, back your guy. If it's, you know, something that he said seven years ago, like the Jeopardy, um, you know, host, where do you fall in on that? Do, are, we, are we too quick with the scythe to lop off people's heads? 
Oh, I definitely think so. Uh, listen, I'm not, I don't ever want, I ever advocate somebody doing something illegal or immoral, you know, in that sense. But if, if you're, if you're just bailing on a guy because he has a different opinion than you, then I, then I think we've got a problem. Uh, you know, it's, and I think part of the problem actually is that comedy is very personal. Uh, you know, if you go listen to a band and they play a song you don't like, you're not apt to just walk out because you're thinking, well, maybe they'll play some more that I like later on. But in comedy, people take it so personally that if they don't like a joke, they don't like you. They don't like the way you think, the way you That's lead your point. life. And yet they know nothing about you. You know, uh, the, I, do, I do a little thing on Facebook on Sundays just called Sunday Mornings with Bill. And it's just a little inspirational 10 minute thing that, you know, just to something nice to give people to, to start their week on. And, you know, I've had people say, why don't you quit trying to convert us and, and preach into us? And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing them. My, and I'm my answer is. I'm just trying to be funny. <laughs> I'm yeah. just trying to be funny on Sundays. <laughs> my well, answer listen, is if, this... if, if you're watching a bad TV show, do you just sit there and watch it or do you change the channel? Get up and change the right. channel. Well, I would never do that when you're on. And you know what, Bill? It's been yeah. really nice to talk to you. Thank you for doing this. Really appreciate it. I just want to give a plug, too. Be sure to catch Blue Color Auction on Circle TV. It premieres after this. Thank you, Bill. Ashley, I, I don't want to go fangirl on you, but this has been great. I've loved every second of this. Oh, mwah. see you soon, my friend. We're back right, right. after Bye-bye. Be safe. Hey, just before we leave you tonight, I just want to let you know that tomorrow uh, we're going to do a, a special report on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. If you don't know, um, I've been at this game a long time, and on 9-11 I was actually trapped in the uh, debris of the North Tower, and I saw these images up close and personal firsthand um, reporting live as Tower 7 actually came down. Um, and, you know, when we were planning the show for tomorrow night, I happened to find out a pretty interesting little moment that I wasn't the only person who was, you know, uh, trying traumatized by that day. The senior broadcast producer I work with right now, who's at the helm of this show, uh, he was also in the Pentagon and nearly died. And so I'm going to turn the mic on him in the control room tomorrow night. We're going to talk a little bit about what happened to me, and we're going to talk a lot about what happened to him. And we're going to honor um, all the differences uh, in our society in the last 20 years. So I really hope you'll join us. A special show tomorrow night. Thanks for being here tonight. See you tomorrow.